Welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where tour players, legends, and the top instructors in the game share their stories, insights, and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by TaylorMade Golf, the PGA Tour Superstore, Two Under, Golf Pride, Strixon Cleveland Golf. Your best performance starts with the right golf ball. Sun Mountain Golf Bags, Finn Scooters, making the game more fun. Adele Golf, hit it, flip it, dial it in. And the Mclemore Club Experience, live above the clouds. Now, here's your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks, and thank you for coming back and joining me on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro. Tonight, I've got four great guests that I've been looking forward to sharing with you, including two former PGA champions, a tournament director for one of the longest-running tournaments on the PGA Tour, and my Thursday Night Tailgate co-host. We're going to talk about each of them more in a moment. But before we do that, I want to thank all of you again for keeping the show steady at number two, and the Podcast Magazine Hot 50 list for the month of July. Your support has been so amazing. We've got one spot left to get, so please continue to vote, and you can do so daily by going online to podcastmagazine.com forward slash hot 50. We're so close. Your votes are very important. I thank you for taking a moment out of your busy schedules to support the show. It means a great deal to me. This week, I want to give a special shout out to Debbie Taylor. Debbie is a very positive influence out there on social media. She's a sports reporter for Core Magazine. Give her a follow on Twitter at Debbie W. Taylor, D-E-B-B-I-W-T-A-Y-L-O-R. She's a great follow and a wonderful person. Debbie, I really appreciate all of your fantastic support. Thank you so very much. Okay, on to tonight's show. First up is going to be a guy who has quickly become one of my favorite people to talk to. And that's 1978 PGA champion John Mahaffey. Tonight, I'm going to get John's thoughts on the Open Championship and his experiences playing in the Open over the course of his playing career. I'll get his thoughts on what's going on between the PGA Tour and Live Golf, right? That's the hottest topic out there in the sport. We'll also go back and relive more exciting moments from his 1978 PGA Championship victory. Plus, we'll talk about his transition to broadcasting. Really looking forward to having John back as part of the show. He'll join me here in just a few minutes. Following him, I'll get a return visit from another one of my favorite guests and another PGA champion, Sean McKeel. I'm going to get Sean's thoughts on the Open Championship and his memories from playing in the 2005 Open that was played right there at St. Andrews. We'll talk a bit about Liv as well. Plus, aside from the majors, where were his favorite stops on the PGA Tour over the course of his playing career? Looking forward to having Sean here. He'll join me about 25 minutes from now. And then we're going to round out tonight's show with a visit from my Thursday night tailgate co-host, Bob Lazeri, plus Nathan Groob. Nathan is the tournament director for the Travelers Championship up there in Cromwell, Connecticut. Bob has been covering that tournament for many years. We'll talk about the history of that event, going back to when it was the Sammy Davis Jr. Greater Hartford Open. We'll hear about the exciting and heartbreaking, depending on which player you are, finish to this year's tournament plus the unbelievable amount of money the tournament raises each year for local charities. Looking forward to having Bob and Nathan back with me tonight. They'll join me a little bit later on in the hour. So there you have it, folks. More great stories, tips, and information are coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Teen. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. Before we get started, I always like to remind you about our friends up at the Macklemore. My buddies and I were there again this year for our annual golf trip, and it was even better the second time around. Everything about the place is first class. You got great accommodations. The practice facility is wonderful. Even got better this time with the opening of their new Himalayas putting course. A lot of fun, folks. You got to check that out. The on-premise restaurant is called The Craig, and it has outstanding food and service. And to say the course is spectacular is an understatement. I can't say enough great things about the place, folks. Go online to themaclemore.com to see how great it is for yourself. The course is co-designed by our good friends Bill Bergen and Reese Jones. Our friend and PGA Tour caddy and one of my guests just a few weeks ago, Kip Henley, said, Outside of Pebble Beach, it's the most beautiful 18th hole he's ever seen. Golf Digest agreed. 
naming it the best finishing hole in America since 2000. And then Lynx Magazine doubled down on that, naming it one of the top 10 finishing holes in all of golf. See why we're all saying such great things about the place by going online to themaclemore.com. And folks, this segment of the show is brought to you by TaylorMade. Golf's an interesting game because the better you hit the ball, the fewer shots you have to hit. That means the better you hit the ball, the less golf you actually have to play. That's why TaylorMade made their all-new Stealth Iron. TaylorMade Stealth Irons feature a catback design and a 3D toe wrap designed to help deliver increased distance through the bag and more forgiveness on those occasional, or maybe not so occasional, less than perfect shots. The result? Better shots more often, so you get to have more fun more often. So if you're the kind of golfer who wants to play less golf more often, try the all-new Stealth Irons from TaylorMade, Beyond Driven. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is 1978 PGA champion John Mahaffey. Let me remind you about John's background. He's from Kerrville, Texas, played his college golf at the University of Houston, where he was named a first-team All-American in 1969 and 70. John won the individual title at the 1970 National Championship, and he helped the Cougars to back-to-back national championships in those two years of 69 and 70. He earned his degree in psychology and was inducted into their Athletics Hall of Honor in 1976. John turned pro in 1971. He went 10 times out on the PGA Tour, including that 78 PGA Championships, when he came from seven strokes back with 14 holes to play to win in a playoff. He also won the 1986 Players' Championship. He won once on the Champions Tour. He was a member of the 1979 Ryder Cup team. In 1983, he was inducted into the Texas Golf Hall of Fame. He's written two wonderful books. The first is titled Hogan's Boy, A Journey in Golf. Plus, he's written a mystery novel titled Shafted. You can get both of them out on Amazon.com. And like I said a few moments ago, John has become a wonderful friend of the show, and I'm very excited. He is back with me again tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, John, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Chris. So great to be back with you. Man, we always have a lot of fun to love. I love your show, man. I appreciate you, John. Thank you, sir. So, my friend, it's been a minute since we got to have you as part of this show. Catch us up. What's been going on with you so far here in 22? Well, I'm I'm really busy writing. I'm having a great time doing this. It's a party for me in, in one way. Uh, you know, I get a lot of frustration out. But uh, after after writing the book and, and getting uh, open spot in uh, 2015, uh, Shafted came out in uh, 2021. And I've got a new book uh, at the editors right now. We're looking to get it out uh, by September of this year called Unfinished Business. And uh, it's a continuation of the, of the series. It's a, about a family, uh, the McCall family that grew up in Texas and uh, created a lot of uh, a lot of stir on the golf tour. Uh, the boy uh, Trey did my my hero, and uh, goes through a lot of different things. And uh, unfinished business is, is uh, a continuation of that. And then I've got Dead Quiet coming up after that, and Exoneration, and then Restitution. So I'm busy. <laughs> there you are. And you were telling me prior to the show that your books are going to be available out there on, in audio as well here soon? Well, Shaft it is right now, and I plan on unfinished business and the rest of them as well. Uh, it's it's not as easy to write as people think it is. You, you end up rewriting your book about five or six times, and then when you get the edit back and they say, wait a minute, we, you know, you need to start doing this, then you go write, write another edition of it and another manuscript. So it's a time-consuming thing, but it's so worthwhile when you see the finished product. John, I want to get your thoughts on the Open Championship. We're just a little over a week north of this year's tournament. What's your thoughts about what you saw from Cam Smith and whether he ruined Rory's parade or not is is, is a good question. But get, he gets his first champion, major championship, and it was a heck of a tournament. I think it was a terrific tournament. I look at this kid, and I saw how he, he, he putted it uh, every time, every round, I guess, he played. Uh, for quite a while, he's played it great, but at the TPC when he won the Players' Championship, and then to, he's like Ben Crenshaw on steroids. I mean, it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. He's the best putter I've ever seen. This, Bobby Locke was great. I never met him, uh, and he was a fabulous putter, but if he was any better than this guy, that would be amazing. And, John, we're used to seeing Open Championships played in all kinds of bad weather. Typically, what they say at, at an Open Championship, you, you may see all four seasons. And during a given round, 
this time pretty benign condition. And the guys go out there. Cam Smith wins at, at, at 20 under. Um, guys shooting way under par. We're, we're seeing guys driving the par fours and that sort of thing. Is that is that good? Or is that just sort of something that we need to say, okay, they went out, they played, they shot way under par, they were driving the par fours, all that sort of stuff, but it was St. Andrews, it was an open championship, there was no weather, it is what it is? Or does the RNA really have to start thinking about what they're going to do to protect St. Andrews the next time it comes back around in the Rota? Well, I think it's just it is what it is. I mean, the weather's a crapshoot over there, we all know that, and they got lucky to have, you know, four rounds where it really wasn't too bad. And the golf course was hard and fast, uh, you know, and the guys could just take advantage of it. The guys hit the ball so far anyway, you know, right now. It's, it's incredible. So it's, uh, you start driving par fours and stuff. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, when Cam Smith made a, made par at 17, all right, the road hole, I mean, that was the most incredible par four I've ever seen in my life, almost, on that hole. Other than if somebody made a, bounced it off the, the wall or something like that on the road hole. But, uh, you know, that, that's almost an unmakeable putt. He, he drilled it dead center. John, you played in, I believe, four open championships. Unfortunately, I don't think any of those were at St. Andrews. But talk about your experiences being a part of an open championship. Well, the first open championship, uh, Tom Watson and I went over uh, to play Carnoustie and uh, went over a little bit early. Hubert Green was with us as well. And uh, it, it was it was an incredible experience. I didn't understand. We had really good weather at Carnoustie, which is unusual there, too, until the final day. I couldn't understand why they had some bunkers where they had them because they were so easy to fly. Not so much when the wind came. It was it, it became a, a brutal test. And, uh, you know, Tom Watson beat Jack Newton in a playoff. And it was actually the first. I finished 10th, so I played pretty well. I had a good run at the Open that year, at uh, the U.S. Open, that is, at Medina, and uh, lost in a playoff to Lou Graham. So my game was strong. And uh, Dave Marr at uh, ABC Sports uh, asked me to, to be a, a, a walking uh, commentator for that, for that playoff, which was my first introduction into television. And I thought that was really gracious of him, a fellow Texan and, and a good friend who I met through Jackie Burks, Jimmy Numerit, and Hogan at Champions. So, you know, it was, it was a great week for me. Uh, unfortunately, that was the best I finished in, in, in the Open Championship. The others I didn't pair very well. Uh, several of them, I don't think I made the cut. Uh, it was, it, it was a different game for me over there. I'm not, not a particularly good cold weather player, and that's not an excuse. It's just a fact. And uh, I never did fare very well in that kind of situation. Uh, other players seem to thrive on it. And, John, as you alluded to a moment ago, did you get into a tournament over there where the weather was just crazy with the winds howling and the rain and the sideways rain and all that sort of stuff that we're used to seeing? All right. Here, <laughs> I hate to admit this. My my last official event that I think I played on, on the, the senior tour was the senior uh, open championship in Muirfield. And uh, it was raining sideways. And the first day, and I was having trouble. Uh, I had some hip issues at that time. and It was cold and it was blowing sideways. And the wind was coming in and blowing sideways. The rain was coming down so hard. And it it was freezing for me. I had on everything I could wear and I shot 93. Wow. And I could, yeah, I know. <laughs> And, I, and the guys, you know, I'm sitting in the, in, the, in the tent, in the scoring tent, and I'm thinking, you know, guys, you know, and the weather was supposed to be worse the next day. And I said, yeah, I, I can't do this, guys. I'm not going to come out here and shoot 100. You know what I mean? Uh, so I went through from the tournament. Just I'm basically out of embarrassment. I hate to admit that, but it was just uh, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, and, and I was having issues with my hip, really bad issues, which I got them replaced shortly thereafter, uh, a bilateral hip replacement. So, I had a legitimate excuse. It's just that uh, that 93 was a little stinging. <laughs> John, let's switch gears a little bit. I, and I, the sport is all a buzz about live golf and the PGA Tour versus <laughs> live golf and players going over and playing on, on live now and you know, being suspended from the PGA Tour permanently and guys withdrawing from the PGA Tour and that sort of thing. If this thing had come about, I don't know, 36 years ago or so, when when John Mahaffey is hoisting up the Players' Championship trophy and Greg Norman had showed up with a, a large check for you, how would that have turned out? I I think I'm too much of a traditionalist, Chris. I uh, I was lucky enough, the people that I grew up around when I when I started playing, 
on the professional side of golf were incredible. When I got to work with Jackie Burke and Jimmy DeMarin at Champions, met Hogan through DeMarin became, uh, he was my mentor for almost 20 years. Uh, the A Bear brothers came there all the time. They're both PGA champions. Met Dave Moore there. Uh, Don January was a good friend of mine. So I was surrounded by people that won major championships and had a, had a, a, a terrific respect for the game of golf and, and, you know, and its history and its tra- tradition. And, uh, you know, the, the tour was, was fabulous to me. It really was. Uh, and I felt like that I was fortunate enough to be able to give back to it. And I was on, uh, two policy boards back to back to, uh, three year terms, uh, in the eighties, uh, when we, uh, were able to come up with a deferred compensation, what we call our pension fund, uh, fund which is one of the best in, in sports. And the other was uh, when we came up with the TC, PPC concept that, that Dean Beeman had, and uh, where we wouldn't have to rent golf courses and spend money there. To, we'd have a, a, a something that would actually make money for us and when we could put in a, a reserve so that we could actually increase the purses. So, I mean, we were proactive a lot more back then, I think. And, John, we're hearing more names come out, it seems like, every week. There's a couple of more players moving across and, and that sort of thing. If if that were to continue to happen, once we get north of the FedEx Cup Championship and we see more and more guys signing up for this thing, if you're Jay Monahan, what do you do from there? Where 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 does this thing go? I don't know. We're looking at a battle of egos right now, I think, between Norman and, and Monahan. You know, and so I don't. I really don't know. I, I can't believe they didn't see this coming. I mean, uh, Greg Norman's been throwing this for three decades. You know, he, he's been trying to, to, to eke into this, and, and now he's got some some huge backing. And uh, you know, they're making a run at. Uh, it, it's I don't I don't know where it's going from here. I think we have to wait and see. Uh, the PGA Tour, as I say, with its history and tradition and respect for the game, and and the PGA Tour made all of us. I mean, you know, the thing is, the the game of golf doesn't owe us anybody anything i mean but you know the ones of us that that play the game at the highest level we owe the game everything and that's the way i look at it so you know i have respect for the game i have respect for the tour that allowed me to make a name for myself and do what i wanted to do and, and what i i love to do for a living um so i really i don't i don't know that that money's as important to me as as all the other things are are the, are the are the other values that that the, the tour suggests? You know, are you seeing anything that that Live Golf is doing that you you say, well, you know what, that's a pretty good idea, or that's a a great thing to do? And boy, I sure wish the PGA Tour might steal that idea. Is there anything good that you're seeing from over there that you'd like to see Monahan import into the PGA Tour? I'm not as up to date on that as I probably should should be, uh, but <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know that <laughs> we could increase the purses or whatever, so like which they already did. You know, uh, yeah. the the tour did, and it has some different kinds of formats at the end. But you know, basically, this whole game of golf. I mean, we we played under this the same rules and formats for 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 a hell of a long time. By you know, that were agreed upon by the governing bodies of the game. So you know, my goodness. Uh, all this other is, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, t- it's so totally different than anything I think we've seen. And I'm not going to say it's not going to work. I don't know. You know, it's, it's up to what time will tell. John, you mentioned a, a minute ago about giving back to the game. You and Dottie Pepper not only made a great team broadcasting tournaments, you also do a great job giving back to the game among many other places, I'm sure. You've helped kids at the St. John's Clinic Classic up at Anderson Country Club. I was reading an article about that a few days back. Talk about why giving back and doing more for the game and helping kids is so important to you. Well, that's what the game is all about. The charitable contribution from the PGA Tour in the billions, all right? And they we have more money to charities and, and help people in more communities than any other sport. Or all, for all the sports put together. I mean, that's part of the deal. We are so fortunate. I, I touched on this, but to be able to do what we do for a living and, and have been healthy most of us, most of our careers, you know, and, and to have lived our dream. All right. A lot of these children, they need the opportunity to live their dream. And, and it's important 
that we, we support these, these institutions that help people. And that's what the tour is all about. It's about giving back. It's, a, you know, the thing about, I mean, in my opinion, there's a huge difference between using the game to, to feather your own bed or growing the game, by, you know, by sharing your experience or actually benefiting golfers and, and even making it more enjoyable for them to play. I'll tell you a great example is Lee Trevino. You know, all the things you see on social media with his little tips and quips and all that kind of stuff, that's great stuff. And he's helping people. You know, he's not, uh, uh, he's not making a fortune doing that. I don't know. I don't know if he's paid to do it. I, in a lot of cases, I doubt it, but he loved, that's what we did. We love the game so much. We want to give it back. We want to help people be better players. We want to help people enjoy the game of golf and actually be able to write, to relate to us as human beings giving back. And John, as you mentioned, Lee Trevino, he's a guy who seems like is putting on a golf clinic every day of his life, wherever he's around. He's talking golf to them, and he certainly did from the videos that I saw of him up at the Open Championship a few weeks ago. I imagine you guys have been around each other a lot over the years. Talk about what it's like being around Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino helped me more than more than anybody else before I met Hogan. I'll put it that way. Uh, Lee Trevino, I played with him in the uh, 1970 U.S. Open at Hazeltine. I was an amateur, and I played with him in the last round. And... Uh, as we're walking up the, the final hole, the 72nd hole, he says, he looks up the scoreboard. He says, Hey, he doesn't remember anybody's name. He didn't know my name was John, Jack, or whatever. He knows, Hey, you know, Hey, pro or Hey, you or whatever. But he says, Hey, he says, you know, uh, if you par this hole or if you birdie this hole, you're a low amateur for the U.S. Open on your own. If you par it, you tie a crunch job. Yeah. I'm not trying to put any pressure on it. Just letting you know, cause he hadn't been looking at the scoreboard. I mean, he's observing about everything, right? So I end up making par. Time Crenshaw for low amateur. So we're, we're sitting in the scoring tent and, uh, Lee goes, Hey, uh, are you thinking about turning pro? And I said, well, uh, yeah, I, I kind of am. I said, you know, I've, I've had a pretty good run at the University of Houston and stuff. But, uh, and this, the U.S. Open was right before the NCAA at Ohio State, my, my final one in 1970. So Lee says, uh, but if you're going to turn pro, that little duck hook you got, you got running, you know, out there and stuff. He says, that's not going to work. You're not going to make a lot of money, especially in major championships. He said, your short game's fabulous. You get it up and down in the garbage can. That ain't going to last forever. He said, let me show you something. When you get it after your little, uh, after the guys in the gray jackets and the ties and stuff give you your little trophy, he says, I want you to come over to the practice team. I want to show you something. He took the time after the U.S. Open to take an amateur over to the practice team and teach me how to hit a fade which I used in the NCAA the very next week to beat Lanny Watkins, by the way, by a shot. Wow. So, so I mean, you know, and and all through my career, Vino was there with some help. I, I lost a, a tournament of champions one time to Johnny Miller because on the final hole I hit a, my second shot and it actually rolled up against the fringe. I didn't know about the bladed wedge, I, I, you know, uh, or, or a three wood or whatever. So I tried to putt it, uh, obviously hit it a little fat, left 10 feet short, missed the putt, and Johnny Miller won. Trevino's waiting for me outside of the scoring ten again with three golf balls and a sand wet. He took me up to the putting green, showed me how to do this. These are people that gave back, that have been giving back to the game forever. I mean, this guy dug it out of the dirt. He figured out how to play, and then <laughs> awfully well, but wasn't afraid to share it. If he knew that you you had aspirations to, to go where he'd been, okay? John, you talk about going to the practice team. I want to take you back to your victory at the PGA Championship in 78 because you opened the tournament shooting 75, but you didn't go back to the hotel and sulk or whatever. Think about that. You might have blown your chance to win that golf tournament. You go back to the practice range and you practice until dark until you found something. What would you find? It was an alignment issue, partly. Uh, I was aiming too far to the right and, uh, I, I would, wouldn't let my body clear enough. I couldn't get, I was blocking myself out. So I was losing power and distance. And, um, and I played horrible all year. I'd only made like $10,000 up to that point and coming back from an injury the year before, you know, and, uh, and Oakmont's brutal. It's a hard golf course, but on the, all of a sudden I started just hitting it dead solid and solid. And, and, you know, and you hate to say it because I've learned this years before that when you say, I think I've got it. You've lost it because it won't, it won't, it, it loses to see it and it goes away. You know, it's, it's like karma says, so see. You. And, uh, anyway, so I, 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 I thought, you know, if I can just take this to the golf course, 
for three more days. First of all, I got to see if I can make the cut with it, which I did. Uh, I played, and then I had three rounds in the 60s, my last three rounds in the 66 on Sunday, and uh, was able to catch Tom Watson, who didn't have a terrible round, but had some unfortunate things happen on the back nine. And, uh, you know, I ended up winning in the playoff. Uh, but it was, uh, it was magical for me that, that the last three rounds at, at, at Oakland, uh, I don't think I ever, the whole week, I don't think I ever hit it in, a, in a, one of the, the church view bunkers. So that's a pretty good, pretty good deal. I was hitting it okay, but I wasn't hitting it good enough. I mean, 75 is horrible, right? To begin with. And then after that, to back it up with three rounds in the sixties, I did find something. Yeah, and talking about magical, in that final round, obviously we talked about how you come back, you're, you're seven strokes down with 14 to play, you're five strokes back with nine to play after Watson Eagles number nine. You go to 10, and you make a 60-foot putt that probably broke that much, too. Talk about that putt, and <laughs> yeah. was that kind of the moment that you thought, you know what, hey, I still got a shot at this thing? Well, when I made it, Tom Watson made a double boat, so that was a three-shot swing. So he got caught up in the rough and it stayed in the rough and then he just, you know, he kind of made a mess of it. And uh, I hit it on the, on the front right of the green and the pin was in the back left and the green's got a lot of slope in it right to left. And I played this thing up by the fringe and I'm, like you said, it probably had a 60 feet of break. And, you know, it's just one of those things you're not going to make that putt one in a million. And I mean, it just went in, it just dropped in, uh, cause those greens were still so quick. We'd had rain that week. But they're the fastest greens I've ever played in my life. And, uh, and I put it well. In fact, I, I took, uh, little known fact, I took my mother's putter. She had an 8802 that she cut down, I cut down for her. And it was really, really light. And I hadn't putted well all year. So I thought, what the heck, we'll give it a shot. And I put it beautifully that week. And then went on the next week playing slow greens up in Massachusetts and beat Raymond Floyd by two shots to win back to back tournament. So. You know, I did find something on the on the uh, practice range, and I found something on the putting green as well. And, John, for those of us, 99.99% of us are never going to know what it's like to win a major championship. But when you get into that three-way playoff with Watson and Jerry Pate, you win it with about a 20-footer on the second playoff hole, and you knew it was in when it was about two feet from the hole. Fans rush to green. You practically jump in your caddy's arms. For those of us, they want to live vicariously and know what it's like. What were those few seconds like for you? Hey, it was like the weight, of the, well, the weight of the world was off my shoulders. I'd lost the U.S. Open in 1975. I lost another U.S. Open in 1976. So, you know, and here I have another chance. And uh, and I was lucky to get in the playoffs. Jerry Pate missed a short putt at the last hole. He kind of horseshoed on him, and he missed it and allowed Watson and I to get in the playoffs. You know, part 18. So we go to the first hole. We both make, we all make pars. And they had irons off the tee at number two. And I thought, well, okay, this is one of the shorter holes at, at Oakmont, but it's pretty tight. A little water, a uh, little creek up the left side. I'm going to hit a three wood at that creek and cut it off the creek. And that'll leave me a shorter iron in there. And I can hit an eight or nine iron where they're hitting a longer club into the green. And Pate missed the green. Uh, and he makes bogey. Watson hits it on the front. Now he's got to come up over a huge mound and everything else. If he doesn't get hit hard enough, it's going to come back to him. If it hits too hard, it's going to. Might roll off the other side of the green. So he makes, he hits a decent putt, but he's still, uh, he's inside my putt, but he's not, uh, it's no gimme by any means. So I actually only had about an eight or nine, about a 12 footer, I guess, for, for birdie from the left side. And it's probably one of the quickest putts, putts you'd ever have. Uh, it broke left to right slightly. And I just touched the thing and I put it right on the line, right on the spot. That I thought that I thought it would break, and it never wavered, and it went right in the middle. And I did know about a foot from the hole that that was dead center. And it took every all the frustration, all the all the nightmares. Although you still get, I don't care, you still come back about some of the ones you let get away. But uh, it, they were all gone. And now finally, finally, you know. And, and the one thing that that was sort of the icing on the cake was the fact when Watson came up to me, we were really good. We've had been for a long time. And he put his arm around me. He said, well, J.D., uh, my middle name's Drake. So I'm J.D. He said, J.D., you finally got one you deserve. He says, you know, uh, I didn't give it to you. You won. And he said, well done. So I think that's pretty cool. Wow. That is pretty cool. Mr. Hogan was still alive at that time. In fact, it was just a week after his 66th birthday. Did you hear from him after the tournament? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
He said, that's one. <laughs> you know, so uh, he was counting. He kept he kept up with me, uh, which was was fantastic. He was he was a wonderful man. He did so much for me in so many ways. Uh, opened a lot of doors, and uh, just the fact that that uh, that I had him as a friend and and, and as a mentor, uh, it, it 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 was like getting instant respect from the rest of the players on the tour, and that's what we're all after anyway. I think is to get the respect of your tour uh, of your uh, peers out there because i mean you know these guys down finally you know first of all when you win a tournament you feel like okay uh i'll be remembered somewhat in the game you win a major you'll never be forgotten you know so that, that's that's a wonderful wonderful feeling because i feel like all just like all that hard work has really paid off john before i let you go remind our listeners again how can they get a copy of your book and then follow you online and on social media well, you can go to johnmahaffeyauthor.com, and it has everything there you need to see. You can order the book right off of that. John, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of this show. It's always a treat to get to spend time with you. I hope I get the privilege of doing it again real soon. Oh, anytime. You know it. I love this. This is a lot of fun. You're great. <laughs> I appreciate you, John. You're fantastic, my friend. All the best to you and your family. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. Okay, say how to sound for me. I will do it. Take care, John. All right, thanks. That is the great John Mahaffey. JohnMahaffeyBook.com is the website. The books are fantastic, folks. you got to get your hands on both of those. And now we know that there's a second book. There's an audio book. There's a fourth uh, fourth book. It seems like it's, uh, you know, the series is just going to go on and on, which is good news for all of us that love reading about the game of golf. And then you, you kind of tie in a mystery novel in there and get to have a series of that stuff written by John Mahaffey, doesn't get any better than that, folks. So make sure you take a look at his website. Uh, He's on Twitter, at Hogan's Boy. You can follow him there as well, and uh, just a wonderful human being. I can't thank John enough for his time, and I'm already looking forward to the next time. Before I get to my next guest, Sean McKeel, I want to remind you about a couple of our sponsors, starting with our friends over at Adele Golf. Is your driver adjustable? Of course it is. How about your irons? Didn't think so. Adele's new SMS irons give you adjustability in an iron to match your swing. These new irons come with three weights lined up across the back of the club. By moving the heavy weight to the heel, center, or toe location, you can match the club to your swing instead of vice versa. The result? Total control of the club face for more distance and accuracy. Your irons can't do this. Check them out online by going to AdeleGolf.com. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Squares Golf. Are you like me, always considering new golf equipment, maybe a new driver? Well, let me reset your thinking because I discovered Squares Golf Shoes. The patented Squares Toe provides balance, stability, and a wider base for increased connection to the ground, effectively increasing your swing speed by 2.2 miles per hour and an average of 9 yards of distance. Independent testing proves it. That's right. It's proven in science. Go to squares.com, get the Squares 30-day money-back guarantee, and use promo code DISTANCE to get $20 off. Remember, distance comes from swing speed, and swing speed comes from your connection to the ground. Squares, the distance golf shoe. Okay, now back and next on the tee with me is a guy who has been a very important part of this show since he first joined me all the way back in May of 2014, and that's 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. Sean is by far one of the most underrated players who may have ever played out on the PGA Tour. I don't think he gets nearly enough credit for what he's achieved over the course of his playing career. Not only did he win the 2003 PGA Championship, he very nearly backed it up in 2006 when he finished second behind Tiger Woods at Medina, which people tend to forget. He would go on to defeat Tiger that year at the World Match Play Championship in the first round of that event, 4-3. and three. Sean has 20 top 10 finishes, 57 top 25s. He is one of only three players to ever record a double eagle in the U.S. Open, which he did back in 2010 at Pebble Beach. Like I say, he's one of my all-time favorites, and I'm very glad to have him back with me again tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Sean, how are you, my friend? Hey, Chris. Good evening. How are you? I'm fantastic. Hey, John Mahaffey wanted me to pass along his hello to you, my previous guest. 
I heard that. I heard that. I was. I haven't seen John in a in a, in a good while. Uh, you know, I used to see you know some of the some of the guys at the at the champions dinner and just over the years and you know um, a lot of them you know just don't seem to come anymore for whatever reason. But um, you know, I would see John on occasion. But uh, anyway, yeah, it was good to listen to him for the last few minutes. He got really. Uh, he was a great player, of course, and. And uh, certainly offers a great perspective on uh, you know the game and the history of the game and, and his relationship with Ben Hogan. I mean, it's probably um, you know probably a friendship that all of us would have loved to have to have had. Um, you know, so uh, but it is fun to be around people like that 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 have the story uh, you know to share with everybody. Absolutely. So, Sean, I know you're fresh off of playing in this year's Senior Open Championship at Glen Eagles over in Scotland. Talk about being a part of that event. Yeah, I mean, it's always good. I, um, I it's, it's, <laughs> it's so disappointing. And, yes, thank you. I did. I got off a plane late last night uh, after you know, a long trip. It's a long way to go to miss the cut by a shot. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, I look forward to these, these events uh, typically. Um, you know, not having played very much over the last couple of years, um, you know, making these trips, I think, is just getting a little, you know, getting a little bit harder. Um, but uh, I had played at Glen Eagles. I played at the Centenary Course, which is where they had the Ryder Cup in 14. And this was, uh, you know, they got 54 holes there. And this was a, a, a lot. It was an inland length course. Um, you know, kind of pot bunkers. Um, you know, scattered about. I mean, they weren't as penal as uh, some that you might find in other places, but um, 12 or 13 blind shots off the tee, which was always interesting. So, um, you know, a bit of run. They had a bit of rain on Sunday, but, you know, it's always good. I think it's tough, tough at my age now to get over there. And, and uh, I didn't get there until Monday, and I think I kind of paid the price for that. Uh, you know, the jet lag thing is real. <laughs> you know, so you got to be on your game. I mean, these guys play very well um, still, especially the, the the locals over there. And Darren Clark got it done. So I enjoy, um, you know, I've always enjoyed major championship golf. I understand it's, it's a senior major, but the feeling is the same. You know, you're playing um, with a lot of other players that have won major championships and had great careers, Hall of Fame careers, and um, yeah, as you know, I I have traveled my whole life. I've, I've played golf in, you know, outside of North America, 31, 32, 33 other countries in my career. Um, and I've always enjoyed that. I really have. I, I enjoy playing other courses. Um, you know, I've, I've been in other countries, uh, you know, meeting, uh, you know, other people just kind of, just always something I've enjoyed doing. But as you get on these planes, you get older, it just gets a bit more difficult. But it really is kind of a fantastic place. Um, you know, to be over in Scotland. Sean, you played in the Open when it was held at St. Andrews back in 2005. What was it like the first time you stood on the first tee at the home of golf and then put a peg in the ground? Well, I mean, the first time that I played um, there was in 2003 at the Dunhill Link Championship. And I was part of a group. Uh, most of the guys were from Jupiter, Florida. Um, when I had won the PGA, you know, in, in August, this is probably the end of September, I got invited to, to play. And I said, look, I'll play as long as I can bring my dad as my partner. And that tournament is kind of modeled after the Pebble Beach event. So you play with an amateur. My amateur, was, of course, was my father. Um, and you play Kings Barnes, Kern Easton, and St. Andrews. It's three fantastic courses. So to be able to share kind of my first experience at the home of golf with my dad, um, you know, and the other guys as well. But it was just really cool for my dad to be there. And, and look, you step on the tee, and, and I'm no golf historian. I mean, you know, uh, you know, kind of that's, like I said, the home of golf, and you know the history, you know uh, the numbers of players that have won. Um, you know, Jack Nicklaus went on to say that you don't really consider yourself a great Open champion unless you've won one at Andrews, and he always kind of felt that way. There's a big affinity for that particular town um, and the golf course, and it's interesting to kind of see how it holds up to the younger to the younger 
players. Um, so that was what was so interesting about it a couple of weeks ago. But, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's fascinating really to play, you know, that, that style of golf. I'd never really played that style of golf before. And, uh, you know, running the balls up, sometimes the fairways are faster than the green. So it takes a little bit of preparation, uh, probably a lot more preparation, a little bit more trust, um, in the local caddies. So telling you aim over here and it seems kind of, you know, counterintuitive to be aiming at a control tower that's a mile away on Lucas Air Force Base and it would be the top of this gorse bush, but you kind of go with it. And it's just, it's fun. It's fun golf. Um, uh, of course, until you get to the tournament. Most of the tournaments are fine until the actual, until Thursday shows up. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, going around the RNA clubhouse and seeing the history and, uh, the town is real, is, is makes, is as important really as the golf course because the, the, it's a public park, basically. You know, St. Andrews is a park. And after, I mean, not long, you watch it, not long after, after Cannon Smith won, there were people walking the dogs down the 17th fairway. I mean, it's just, it's just a fantastic place. And, um, there's a sense of pride there about and not only professional golf, but just the history of the game and, um, you know, what it means to people around the world. And I think, uh, you know, it just, it's just kind of, it's just a really, really neat place to go and play. Uh, and the good thing is it's easy to walk. Now, you know, you just want to make sure you get it on, on good weather days. Um, you know, but uh, it really is just truly a, a, a fantastic place to be, and it's, it's a bucket list item for anybody that, that's uh, looking for a place to play. Sean, you mentioned earlier about the other countries that you've traveled to and played in, and I want to take you back to 1998. You won the Singapore Open that year, and that's a pretty big tournament. I mean, other winners, you got several other major championships, uh, major champions that have won there. Adam Scott, Angel Cabrera, Sergio Garcia. A couple of years ago, Matt Kuchar goes over there. He gets a win in 2020. Talk about going over there and then getting that win. Well, you know, I had played twice on the PJ Tour in both 1994 and 1997. So I was a couple of years out of college in my first year. And it really took me a while um, to kind of get my feet really under me. And, and um I think just my personality, as I've gotten older, I've kind of realized, golly, I just was not, not ready for it. I mean, my ball striking and things like that were pretty, you know, were, were great, but I just didn't handle some of the things, some of the crowds and, and all that stuff in the first couple of years. So after I lost my card in 97, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who I had gotten to know. We had to share the same manager and then Charlie and, uh, Charlie was, uh, Korean. I, I think he was born in LA, or he could have been born in Korea, moved to LA early on in his life. And I was looking for a place to play, and I had missed out at school. I just, you know, not played well in '97, and of course, when you don't play well for a year, it's kind of hard to get back to the tour school. So they convinced me to go travel, or Richard, as my manager, had convinced me to go travel and go to the European tour or the Asian tour school, which was in Kuala Lumpur. Now, I've never Never been to uh, Kuala Lumpur, but anyway, I got on a plane and over there. Uh, really restrictive tour at the time. I believe that there were only in, in any one particular event, probably a field of 144. Um, you could have, I think there were 35 non-Asian that could play. Now that sounds a little bit funny. I get that, but it, that's kind of how it was. Um, 35 non-Asian players per event because it's the Asian tour. They really wanted to, to focus on, on their players and, and, uh, but they did allow it to be open. And so I, I finished high enough in the Q school that I maybe top five or so. And so I played and, uh, you know, I ended up finishing third on the order of merit, which is a pretty good accomplishment considering I only played probably eight events out of a 15, uh, tournament schedule. Just, you know, I was trying to do other things back in the States too. So, um, that was that was a tremendous accomplishment for me because I had lost so much confidence and, and at the time I felt like well maybe if I just get away from the state just get away from uh, you know the tour life and, and those types of things that I can kind of get and just focus on my golf and that's really what I think happened to me because when I came back in uh, 1999 or you know the Q school of 98. 
I got my Nike tour card, as it was called back then, and then went on to win in Greensboro and finished ninth on that money list and was on tour ever since, pretty much. So um, it was a fantastic experience. And um, I think people miss out. You know, me, along with a lot of other players, sometimes kind of get labeled as a journeyman pro, um, which, you know, does have a negative connotation, I think, when you first read about it. But as a player that's kind of experienced all of that, um, I look at it as just kind of a badge of honor. I mean, you know, as much as I've traveled, Americans and American players kind of get knocked for, you know, not leaving their home country and not going and visiting some of these places and, and taking their game and sharing it with other, with other players, with other people. Um, and so it was just something I did. It was something, first of all, I needed to, um, if I wanted to play competitive golf and play for a significant amount of money. And, uh, and so I did that. And my experience was, was, uh, was fantastic. I mean, I played in, you know, China and, and, uh, Macau and, uh, Myanmar, Calcutta, India. I mean, I've been all over Bangkok and, you know, all these great places. Um, and that's where I met a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of my European friends, like, and, and Indian friends, Jeeve Nicholson, Nicholson, um, you know, Darren Clark and I played a bunch together in there. VJ and I actually played in Macau one year. Um, so there were there were a lot of players. Of course, it was co sanctioned with the kind of the European tour and, and, and several of the events. I was also maybe trying to use that to maybe get some leverage to play some European events, which I did. So, um, you know, we could talk all day really about my experience in Asia and kind of what it led to, um, you know, both um, in my personal uh, experience in, in my professional experience, but I uh, I really enjoyed it, and I look back, it just was a fantastic part of my life. Um, you know, I was young, and I wasn't married at the time, and uh, didn't have a lot of responsibilities other than to myself and to try to figure out a way to get get back to the PJ Tour, and uh, so I used definitely used that um, as a way to kind of get my experience and confident stuff to get back on the PJ Tour. Sean, one more before I let you go. And obviously, live golf is the is all the rage right now. All the talk of uh, of golf, aside from all of the issues and the money and all of that sort of thing. When you look at what Greg Norman and that tour is doing, are there anything that that you're that you witnessed or you're reading about or seeing that you say, you know what, that's a pretty good idea. I sure think the the PGA Tour ought to consider doing that. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I heard some of the comments John had, and I might take disagreement with some of the things he said. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's so different. I mean, you know, golf is such a different sport, it's a different type of sport. It's always been kind of an individual sport. Um, you know, and you you have these team events, you know, every other year, you know, or at least the Ryder Cups every other year, and then you get the President's Cup. Maybe people are starved for team golf. I mean, clearly that's what they're trying to model themselves after. Now I'm reading today about, you know, the relegation and both my kids are, are soccer players. So I know, you know, and I follow the Premier League a lot. So I know about relegation and things like that. Um, the team concept, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's so much different than, you know, what I'm used to as playing, uh, as being a PJ Tour member. Um, but you just look at the colors. Look at the colors of the teams. They're all bright colors. And to me, it seems like it's going to be geared towards gambling is what it seems like to me, which I think puts the players in a very precarious position. Um, and it's another thing to kind of get off topic a little bit is I, I don't, I don't really agree with what the tour is doing with, um, some of the gambling sites that they have. Um, you know, and it just seems to me that maybe live golf is, is kind of geared a little bit more towards that. Um, you know, again, we could talk all day really about what I think and whether it even matters. It doesn't. Um, but it, to me, it just seems like maybe there's a little bit of an axe to grind. Um, Greg has an axe to grind that he, you know, the thing that happened with the World Golf Championships back in the mid nineties. Um, uh, and maybe look, anytime something is new, I think people are either immediately drawn to it or they're immediately, um, Skeptical, 
and they throw out a lot of comments. There's a lot of negativity um, by people that have never played the PJ Tour, and I kind of chuckle at a lot of the comments that I see on Twitter because these people don't have a clue how the PJ Tour works, you know. And um, y- you know, and you look at the money situation. Um, people are wanting to play for the guaranteed money. I understand that Martin Slumbers from the RNA was talking about the meritocracy, the, the merits of having a merit-based game, and if you play well and all this stuff. But you know. It's just different. It's a different, it's a different way to play the game. And to me, it seems like maybe the tour has. I'm not saying they they didn't give it any consideration, but this was coming on for the last couple of years, really. And you know, the the tour just uh, seems to me like they've, you know, made some pretty bold statements and they're banning players, and which is which is having maybe a negative effect on the sponsors. I mean, I, I look at my own tournament here in Memphis, the FedEx St. Jude Invitational, and which I've played in 23 times, I think, in my career. And, uh, of course, my dad was a FedEx pilot, one of the first FedEx pilots. And St. Jude's a big part of my life in Memphis and the tour. Um, you know, Justin Johnson's not going to be here. I mean, all the guys. I mean, we read that today that, that they're now banned from the playoffs. We are hosting the first playoff event. Here in a couple of weeks, and I think that, that some of the some of the fans are not going to be able to see these guys aren't going to be able to play. I mean, are the sponsors questioning? You know, Jay's motivation by just banning these players without without consulting sponsors, and maybe yes, and maybe the sponsors are fine with it. I have no idea, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things about it. Um, you know, I don't mean to take up all your time. Um, you know, I think for every right. opinion that I have. There are probably one or two that would probably, you know, argue against what, you know, my thoughts are, and, and they may even be right. I mean, but it, it's it's taken up a lot of conversation. It really has. I mean, I talked about it with Keith Goose, and I played the Pro-Am together last week with uh, ESPN Deportes, uh, John Sutcliffe, you know, the announcer for them, and we were talking about just all the different things, uh, you know, kind of going on and with the tour, and, you know, Anyway, it, it's just really hard to, to kind of see um, some of the players. I'm not saying they're abandoning the tour. And I think some of the comments that I read on social media sites talk about, oh, they owe the tour this. The tour gave them everything. And even John alluded to that a little bit. I don't agree with that because the tour doesn't give you anything. You know, when I got on tour, I, I was a first team All American in 1991. It was me and Phil and David Duvall and you know, I won five college tournaments in second four or five times. They didn't give me anything. Now, now there's a PJ Tour University, PJ Tour U, where these top players they get they get a they get a Cornberry membership. Well, they didn't give me anything. And the tour, you know, you have to get onto the tour. You have to earn your way onto the tour. They don't just say, okay, well, you're going to play and you're going to play. We're not we're going to draft you. They don't. You have to earn everything. I mean, the tour provided an opportunity place to play that had been around how I many professional golf and the tour have been around since the 50s, 40s, 50s, you know, when the guys broke away and then thankful to Jack and Arnold and then, th- you know, thanks go out to, um, you know, Gary McCord for, you know, going from basically 60 exempt players to, to you know, 125 exempt players. Or, I'm, you know, I may have my numbers a little bit off, you know, but, um, you know, it, it was the players that did that. I mean, it wasn't the tour said, oh, let's, let's increase the field size. Then guess what now? They're trying to cut the field size. Well, they're going to. The exempt, the exempt is going to 70 for the playoff. They're still going to keep it at 125. So I just kind of chuckle at some of the things. I don't mind the competition. I don't know if the tour just misjudged, um, the actual interest. Um, you know, it'd be like, like a, 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 a a pilot at another airline, and he decides, oh, you know, I'm, I've been flying for this airline for a while. Oh, but there's an opportunity to visit FedEx because the FedEx captain pays $550 an hour versus $250 an hour in a triple seven. I mean, oh, I'm going to go do that. People are always chasing the money. And, you know, there are principles involved, I guess, and we can get into that debate too. But um, I just think in the end, you know, the tour, you know, 
may just kind of misjudge the, the interest that the players had. Um, I thought some of the talking points some of the players had in the beginning were maybe off base. Oh, I want to play less, or I want to spend more time with my family. Of course, you want to spend more time with me. We all do. Um, you know, different things. I don't want to play as much. I just want to do kind of a few tournaments or whatever. And um, they never mentioned the money. Um, and it was totally about the money. I mean, maybe new, maybe getting to play new golf courses, their smaller fields. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, I guess, why people are wanting to do it. Um, but the longer that it goes on, the more players they continue to, um, you know, kind of get to join really is going to have an impact on the tour and the sponsors that, that, that continue to put up um, the money for the players to play for, the fans, the, you know, the charities, the kids, the new kids that are trying to play the game. Uh, you know, but the PJ Tour is not the only organization that can do that. Um, you know, and I think that's maybe where the tour has kind of gone awry. They basically have determined that if you don't play the PJ Tour, then, then, you know, you're not able to, to grow the game and, um, this is the best place to play. And it is. I mean, look, it's the, it's the best place to play for me because I'm from the United States. Kids in Asia, the best place to play for them was in Asia. The European players, I mean, how many of those guys ever came over here 20, 30 years ago? Very few. And now, you know, the tour's gotten so big, the FedEx Cup, the money, the weather, I mean, the courses. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, why a lot of the players um, are playing in the United States. And now maybe people are just feeling like, hey, I didn't, I played well and I made $5 million, but the tour made $105 million, let's say, and I deserve part of that. You know, a lot of these players, I mean, it takes everybody, it takes employees and it takes workers and, and opportunity to, to grow the business, but um, it's, it's really about the players. And, um, you know, these guys are just chasing. Maybe they just, they just feel like they weren't getting um, kind of what they deserved. I and mean, I think Phil pretty much said that in his comments, which were pretty harsh. Um, but Live Golf is here to say, I do, I do wonder what happens and I'll, and I'll sign off, but I do wonder what happens if they are, if they're unable to, to get world ranking points. Cause I do understand that the comments that are, it's really more about exhibition, um, and what's the incentive to work and, and those types of things. And I think some of those questions were answered with the article I read today about the relegation. There are contractual, um, you know, obligations for some of the players. But at some point, you know, if Phil, you know, like Ratif said, Phil's like 50 over for two events. He's made $200 million. I mean, <laughs> right. so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a crazy world we live in, but I think we're all, you know, kind of caught off guard a little bit when, things start to change because we've been kind of conditioned that the PJ tour is the one and only place to play. And that's just not true. I mean, I, I can tell you, cause I've, I've experienced it. I've, I've played in Asia, I've played in Europe, I've played in South America, I've played in Australia. So, um, a lot, and I'll just say this too, a lot of the tours are basically dead. I mean, I look at what's happened with Australia, I mean, not any golf. I mean, there used to be four or five great events. I played there. South Africa had some great events. That's where I started my career. I turned pro in 1992, in January of 92, and I immediately went to, to South Africa to play the Sunshine Tour. And they've been rescued by the European Tour. Um, but I'll just get back. Is that, you know, I'm, I was conditioned to play in the state and at the highest level on the, and it was the PGA Tour. Um, and so I don't know if I blame these guys or not. I, I mean, um, you know, the guys that are going have plenty of money and it's just kind of the rich get richer. Um, and so, you know, if this is really about kind of Greg's act to grind, I, I don't, I don't really know, but, but he believes in his product and he's providing an opportunity, um, for players and, um, uh, to show off their talents and uh, share their experiences with the fans and, uh, and those types of things. So, you know, 20 years down the road, if it's still around. Maybe we find out it's not such a bad thing, but um, yeah. you know, probably in the minority in that right now, at least in the beginning. 
Sean, before I let you go, remind our listeners how they can stay up to date with the things that you're doing and follow you on social media and online as well. Yeah, you can find me. Just type my name in. It'll pop up somewhere. <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, proudly, proudly a boring follow. I, I'm, I'm more of a follower. Um, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy, uh, reading other people's commentary. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, that's, you know, you can always find me. John, I can't thank you enough for your time tonight. I hope I get the privilege of catching up with you again real soon. You've been very important to the to the history of this show, and you've always been so generous over the years, like I say, going all the way back to 2014. So thank you so much for being here tonight, and I'm already looking forward to next time, my friend. That's great, Chris. I can't believe it's been that long, but uh, yeah, it's always, always enjoyable to be part of your show. Glad you're doing so take, well with it. Take care, Sean. All the best to you and your family. We'll catch up soon. All right. Take care. See you. See you, Sean. That's a great Sean McKeel. You can follow him on Twitter at Sean McKeel PGA. A great guy. Very underrated for over the course of his career. And like I say, he's been on uh, since the very beginning of this show. So I'm very, very much appreciated his time and looking forward to catching up with him again soon. Before I get to my next guest, Bob Lazeri and Nathan Grube, I want to give a shout out to a couple more of our sponsors starting with our friends over at Strixon Cleveland Golf. Your best performance starts with the right golf ball at Strixon. A global leader in golf ball technology and innovation, Strixon offers a wide variety of award-winning golf balls for golfers of every skill level. Whether you're searching for a tour performance golf ball or a distance golf ball with incredible feel, Strixon provides the best golf balls at incredible prices. Strixon offers a wide variety of personalized options, while also developing a highly visible colored golf ball as well. Select the right golf ball for your game today and trust it with Shrixon. Check them out online at Shrixon.com. S-R-I-X-O-N.com. Find the right golf ball for your game today. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Sun Mountain. There's a company nestled in the Valley of Missoula, Montana, that embodies the essence of quality, function, and innovation, and that's Sun Mountain which started building golf bags back in 1981. They are an industry leader in golf bags, travel covers, outerwear, and push carts. With flagship products that you've come to know, like the C-130 cart bag, the 2.5 ultralight stand bag, the club glider travel cover, the speed cart, and Rainflex rain gear. Sun Mountain continues its quest to provide the very best in golf products to every range of golfer. Visit them online at sunmountaingolf.com to look at their amazing products. Okay, now back with me is my co-host from over on our football show, Thursday Night Tailgate, Mr. Bob Lazeri. Bob, how are you, my friend? Hey, it's great to speak with you again, Chris. I'm doing okay. How about yourself? I'm good, thank you. But it's been a minute since uh, we had the, the opportunity to talk to one another since our last show over on TNT. Talk about how, how's your summer going, my friend? Well, you know, I mean, it, it always kicks off with the, uh, the Travelers Championship. Chris, uh, you know, it's the first week, first full week of summer. Travelers is always my favorite week of the year. It's four great days. Uh, you know, we've had a heat wave here the last eight days or whatever. Today it broke finally. So, um, doing my thing, you know, staying fit and, uh, just, um, picking my spots. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Before we get to, to Nathan, we're going to get to Nathan here in just a moment. And he's obviously the tournament director up there at the Travelers Championship in Cromwell, Connecticut, a, a tournament, Bob, you've covered for many years. And people our age likely remember all the way back to the days when it was Sammy Davis Jr. and the Greater Hartford Open back in the day. In the mid-80s, the, the, the tournament took a little bit of a turn, moved over to TPC of Connecticut, and then, of course, went through some renovations in the early part of the 90s, and they renamed it to TPC River Highlands. But talk about a little bit of the the history of the tournament and the, and of the golf course since the time you uh, started covering it. Well, Chris, uh, obviously it's a favorite of many of the uh, PGA players. Uh, scores are usually very low. Um, it, it's just a very well run tournament. Um, that's why it's so many of the golfers telling Nathan and uh, even people like myself that it's, it's their, one of their favorite stops on the tour. You know, they always. Uh, Post low scores and they're treated well and, uh, you really can't beat it. It's at a great time of the year. 
Um, but, uh, yeah, as, as far as the TPC itself, Chris, I mean, it's, it's always well kept. I mean, it was immaculate again this year. They're exactly where they should be. And, and, uh, you know, travelers giving a commitment for at least another seven or eight years. Uh, it, the tournament is, is, is in its best shape it's probably ever been in. And I'm just, uh, I'm just very, very fortunate to be a part of it every year. Let's go ahead and, and bring in. Nathan Groove, the tournament director there at Travelers. Let me remind you about his background, folks. Uh, he graduated from Auburn University with a degree in mass communications. After college, he became a wonderful PGA teaching professional. He was an instructor at the Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail Academy from 1996 to 99. He then became a tournament director at the Southern Farm Bureau Classic and the executive director of the First Tee of Greater Birmingham. In March of 2005, he became the tournament director up there at uh, Travelers Championship at River Highland, which, uh, like Bob said, is one of the premier events out there on the PGA Tour. And we're excited he is back with us again this year here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Nathan, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming Hi, back Dave. on the show. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for giving me the time. I was fascinated listening to your interviews, and uh, you guys do a great job with everything. So thanks, uh, thanks for letting me be a part of it. We appreciate you. So, Nathan... This was the 70th anniversary of the tournament, which makes it one of the longest running tournaments out there on the PGA Tour. And I read ticket sales early on were outpacing what they were back in 2019, sort of pre-pandemic. Talk about how things went this year at the uh, tournament. You, you know what? I, I think people were just so excited to not be talking about what they couldn't do and talking about what they could do. I mean, we had, I mean, two years of just, Hey, this is what it's going to be like. This is what we can't do. This is, you know, I mean, just all the protocols in place and from our hospitality clients to the general fans to our volunteers, I mean, everything that they went through, um, in 20 and 21 to put on those, those two years. I mean, just, uh, I mean, kudos to them and the team and the volunteers and our staff to do that. And I think everybody was just so excited this year to be like, wait a minute, there's no, no testing protocols. I don't have mass protocols. There's not a list of 500 things that I have to do before I come on property. And um, it was just a, like this deep sigh of like exhale of like, oh my goodness, things feel normal. And you saw in the ticket sales, you know, I mean, they, they outpaced 2019. You saw in the hospitality sales, things sold out way before uh, they ever have before. Um, and then there was just this general feeling when you walked around on property that I think people your point it's been around 70 years and it's not that you kind of get like oh we're always going to have the tournament but people had a couple years without it right whether they couldn't come out in 20 or there was limited fans in 21 it was like this hometown uh, you know pride that people were like this is our event and like yes missed it so it was a really cool feeling walking around the tournament this year and just the energy and the excitement um and uh it is i mean it's connecticut leans into this event they embrace it um, it's theirs, it's ours. I mean, everybody feels like they own a piece of it. And, uh, it's just, it was really, really exciting to kind of have that energy back this year. And speaking of energy, a Rory comes out and opens the tournament with a round of 62 as the JD po JT Poston. But is that the dream scenario for you to have a player like Rory get the excitement and all the, you know, the tournament revved up by coming out and shooting a 62 on Thursday? <laughs> So, yeah, it makes you look like a genius, right, as an event coordinator. <laughs> um, you know, everybody's like, great job. And you're like, yeah, I had everything to do with Rory shooting eight under. Uh, but, no, I mean, you work so hard throughout the year, right? I mean, you have 300 corporate partners who are investing in the tournament. You have a title sponsor, like Bob mentioned, who, you know, signed on through 2030. You have a golf course that's just in perfect condition. You have, you know, 3,000 volunteers that are ready to go. You have, you know, people lining up at the gates. It's like everything that you can control as an event operator for PGA Tour event, like it's all lined up and ready to go. And then the two things that you cannot control are the weather and how the guys play. And when you get good weather, I mean, it was a little warm. I mean, it rained on Wednesday, but then, you know, we really had, had good weather Thursday and Sunday. And when Rory comes out, you know, and does that, it's like, okay, that's, you know, tournaments dream about stuff like that. When you get you know, some of the top guys in your field, you know, post and top of the leaderboard. It was, uh, it was cool to see, you know, but you also know, and the guys know it is hard to win on the PGA tour. You know I mean? You got, you have four days, 
of just different conditions, different draws. I mean, like they, when you win a PGA tour event, you have earned it and it is not easy. They don't hand it to you. And, uh, you know, Rory was, he talked about that on Thursday. He's like, Hey, great round, but there's a lot of golf left. But I tell you what, right out of the gate, that was, uh, that was pretty exciting to see. Five questions for Nathan. Nathan, again, uh, I want to thank you for the hospitality. Uh, again, that was, it was another great year out there. And we're, like you said, we're getting about as close as you can to feeling back to uh, reality again. And, uh, the weather worked out, like you said, and the crowds were great. And of course, you know, we read that it's about two and a half million dollars are going to charity, which, uh, is what the travelers does great every year. And at the top of that list would be the hole in the wall camp. Who gets a good chunk of that? Talk more about that, Nathan, and uh, especially the hall, the hole in the wall camp, which is right down the road from here. So, it, it, this is something I never get tired of talking about. And I really hope the listeners take just a, a half a second and think about this, right? Because I mean, we, you, you talk about PGA Tour and charity, and you know those things kind of roll off, roll off your tongue. But take that to take that to any other sport, right? I mean, NFL season's coming up. Um, you know, just, just, and I pick your favorite team, whatever it is, and whether it's up here in New England, you get the Patriots or you know, wherever it is. Imagine if, you know, Bob Kraft, um, after the first Patriots home game gets on the loudspeaker and says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out. And, you know, all the corporate partners, thank you so much for your support. You know, when there's, you know, 80,000 people in the stadium going, you know, what's Bob about to say? And, and if he said, because of all your support today, everything we made from today's home game, we're giving to Boston Charities. I'm not taking a cent as the owner. We're giving away 100% of it. It it would probably be one of the biggest stories in sports, right? I mean, it would be like, are you kidding me? Did you hear what Kraft did? He gave away all the money that they made. But that is happening every single week on the PGA Tour. And we did that on Sunday, right? I mean, Xander has an incredible, you know, finish and wins the tournament. And Soth was, you know, coming down the stretch. I mean, there's all this drama coming down. And we stood there. On the 18th green, 10 minutes after the tournament was over, and Alan Snitzer and Andy Bissett with Travelers, so there was a huge crowd, you know, still gathered there and said, thank you so much for supporting this event. Everything we made this week, we are giving back to charity. And that is just something that is so hard to duplicate in sports. I mean, you just don't have that that model out there. And Bob, to your point, two and a half million dollars later, um, you know, it was a $300,000 increase from last year, from 21. Those are real numbers that are impacting real people. And you, you mentioned that the hole in the wall game camp. But I tell you what, if, if you do not know about this camp, if you're from, not from New England or whatever, just, just Google the hole in the wall game camp and it, just spend five minutes looking at what they do. It is, <laughs> I, I will say it this way. In 2007, we were looking for a charity to, to be our primary beneficiary. And we thought, you know, hey, we're going to draw some attention to a charity. We're going to give a charity a platform. We're going to give them the money, you know, kind of like, who are we going to pick? And, you know, we went through this whole process and then we, we, we settled with the hole in the wall game camp. And after about four months, we were, we flipped it around and said, oh my gosh, we are so lucky that the hole in the wall game camp picked us because we are so excited to be a part of their mission and their story. And they basically built a hospital and disguised it as a camp. And they bring out these kids who have been in hospital beds for three, four, five, six, seven, eight months that have these super challenging diseases that do not let them be kids. And they, the, the parents say it the best that you see these, they're, they're sick kids actually being kids for the first time in their lives. And you have these huge, you know, uh, um, tree houses that are wheelchair accessible. You have kids playing and singing and then going getting IVs at lunch because they're 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 sick and then they come back out and they see a bunch of other kids with IVs and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel like a kid. And so it to be able to to do what we do and have the money go there and to see the impact on these kids and the lives and the parents and the families, like it makes you feel so proud to be a part of what we do and to be a part to be a PGA tour event that that um, stands for that and, and does that for its community and but that's happening every week. I mean, you could get, you know, the next tournament on the phone and they could talk about their charitable impact. You could get down the next, you could talk to 45 different tournaments that, that talk about that. And it's, uh, it's something pretty special. It gets you up in the morning. It makes you want to work really, really hard, uh, because you know what happens at the end of the day if you, if you do your job well. And that's what happens. Nathan, I always like to give you the opportunity to brag about your, uh, course superintendent and the ground people there because I walk the entire course, uh, usually, 
I always do it over the four days, usually two times uh, in completion. And it was beautifully manicured as usual. Uh, were there any issues at all this year going back to the early spring in regard to the shape of the course after yet another tough New England winter? Oh, my gosh. I So to your point, Bob, Jeff Reich and that, he's the, the lead superintendent, David Crotto, the GM there at the club. And for those of you who don't know, I would say agronomy of a golf course. I mean, it, it takes an entire year to have that course ready for a seven, for a four day stretch, you know, seven day stretch, but really for the four day stretch due in the fall to basically put the course to bed for the winter and how they monitor it and the freezes and the temperatures and the frost and when to cover the greens and when to uh, I mean, it, 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 it's a living, breathing organism that has to be brought out in the right way. And, and they do a phenomenal job. I mean, it is just, it's an art. It's, it's, it's science mixed with art, but I think it's more art than anything that they basically give this, you know, for lack of a better term, they give this stage to the best players in the world to showcase their talent, you know, and it is an amazing and amazing stage. I, we, we kind of joke about it sometimes. It's like, imagine if you had, uh, you know, Hamilton open up at my high school, right? You know, I put them on my high school stage and you have the, the whole cast there when, you know, when Hamilton was, you know, making its run, it's like, it would be okay, you know, on my high school <laughs> stage, but you know, I mean, you know, the lighting would be all right. Sound would be okay. But like, I mean, you, you put, you put that ensemble on a Broadway stage and it's going to look and feel completely different. And that's what happens at River Highlands. You are putting the best ensemble in the world on the right stage to actually showcase their talents. And if it wasn't as good as it is, it would be like they were performing at my high school. Nothing against my high school. I love my alma mater. My <laughs> class friends too. You know, but uh, I have to say that when you have, when you have the, the superintendent and, and they basically build this Broadway stage for the, the players to showcase their talent, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect blend and, and you get some magical stuff that happens. Nathan, you mentioned a moment ago the drama that unfolded on the 72nd hole, and I kind of I went from a range of emotions to feeling terrible for Sahih Sagala. The guy's a, a rookie out there on the on the PGA Tour. Seems like a really wonderful guy. He hits a magnificent shot on, uh, from a fairway divot on 17, and and makes a, a birdie putt to take the lead outright going to 18. We get a big fist punt from him when that putt drops. And then he hits his drive and in, into the fairway bunker and, and has, has a bit of trouble getting out and, and it has a, a heartbreaking lip out to even save an opportunity for bogey for some hope to get into a playoff. And, and then you switch from that to, to Xander hitting an unbelievable shot there on 18 and, and making a birdie putt to win by two and feeling really good for one of the, you know, young stars out on the PGA tour. So a big range of emotions, but talk about how, how, you, what you saw and what the rest of us saw sort of unfold over the last two holes of the golf tournament. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, there was, there was so much going on. I mean, to your point, just between Soth and, 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 and Xander. And then, but even like before that, the groups coming in, like with Michael Thorbjornsson, I mean, he was one of our exemptions. He finishes fourth and he's this amateur, you know, which is an incredible story in itself and you're kind of watching that unfold coming down the line and then I mean, this is all happening in real time and the crowds i love our crowds my goodness they are they understand the game they understand energy they understand that these players feed off of it and when you get thousands and thousands and thousands of those fans around 18 and they're chanting names and they are you know i mean like uh I mean, it's just like the, the, the players talk about it, that they feed off of it. So they know what's happening down the stretch. And, you know, even when, um, you know, Soth made that, that double, they're, they're chanting his name. And I walked with him up to, uh, you know, sign his card. I'm like, man, listen, you're going to have, a, you're going to have tons of more opportunities like that. I know you're crushed right now. Hang in there. And people around the corner were yelling at him going, keep it, hang in there, man. It's okay. It's okay. He's looking around. He's, giving high fives to the crowd while the tournament's still going on. So, I mean, wow. it's just kind of how all that unfolds in front of the scenes, behind the scenes. Um, and then everything with Xander, you know, and, and he talked about that in his interview. He was feeling the weight of that. People are like, okay, you haven't won in so many, you know, months and you, you, you know, you won a team event and you could kind of say that, it was, you know, he, he kind of was going to chip on his shoulder a little bit. And sure enough, he wins our event and he wins next week and he wins 
guys, you know, so he's like, how's that for stroke play events? Everybody good? You know, that I've won like three in a row. So, um, but I mean, as all that was unfolding, it was, uh, it was just cool to see you can't, you can't script that, you know, you can't, that's what's so fun about managing a tour event is you, you I mean, again, to use the analogy, you set the stage and then it's just like, you just sit there and watch it happen. And I just, I, I get so excited for our fans when they get to experience that and they get to see that. Um, I'll never forget. It was, uh, what was it? 20, uh, 2016, I think when Fuhrer shot, shot 58, I remember a reporter coming up to me and going, man, how the heck are you going to top that? You are so much, you are in trouble next year. You know, you're never going to top this. <laughs> and then, and then, and then speed hits it out of the bunker and, and makes, you know, this, this, this iconic shot in 17 and people are like, okay, well, I'm never going to say that again. You know, like, and then you have this eight hole playoff and then you have like, I mean, it's just, so, I mean, it's, such a good theater for drama around 18 and then how that was all unfolding. It was just really cool to see. And so, I mean, it, obviously I, I get pretty excited about it because you get the energy of it. You're there. And, um, but it was, it was cool. And listen, soft's going to, he's going to win. Uh, he's going to win in buckets out there. He, he's just too much of a talent and he just plays with no fear. To your point, that shot he hit on 17 out of the divot. I mean, you don't, you don't hit shots like that. If you're afraid you're, you weren't trying to not lose, you were trying to win. And when you have that mentality, you're going to win tournaments. And he had that mentality out of that bunker shot on 18. He's like, no, 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 I'm not chip. Like I want to win. And so, I mean, when you get a guy with talent and that drive, he's, he's going to win a bucket. And Nathan, as Bob talked about a little bit, a little earlier, the course is set up for guys to have an opportunity to make a lot of birdies. And is, is that on purpose? Because they're coming off the U S open, which is typically a, a physical and a mental grind. Now, you guys don't want to come and get beat up for two weeks in a row. So they come to TPC River Highlands. They have an opportunity. They know they can they can go low if they play well. Is that a strategy where you want to give these guys a little bit of a mental break and you want it to be a show, so you wanted to make birdies? Talk about setting up the golf course so it's sort of high risk, high reward. So I'll say two things about that, and then I'll come back to Xander's comment in a minute because I think he had one of the greatest comments about it um, in his in his post round interview. But the the guys talk about the course this way. They say a couple things. They say it's set up where it rewards you for good shots and it punishes you for bad shots. And like to to say that about a golf course like that, that's really all I want, right? Like I mean, that's if the guys are saying that, then I am thrilled. And but what you have a combination of those last four holes when you when you turn the corner from 14 and you get to that drivable par 4 15 and that's where 95 percent of our crowds are 15 through 18 so i mean you're kind of you know kind of creeping along and it's you know you're you're making some pots birdies you turn the corner and it's you start to hear just really really loud roars and you're looking at this drivable par 4 and you're looking at guys making three and other guys making six and you're going whoa whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on and guys are hitting in the water on 17 and they're making triple on 16. And then, you know, I mean, it, it's just, there is so much that can happen in those last four holes that the guys love it. You, you don't always get that. I, I remember Charlie Hoffman saying that those four holes would make for a great president's cup finish or a Ryder cup finish because of just how much back and forth there could be um, there. But I, it was interesting because Xander, he was talking about an interview. He said, he, he said, if you fall asleep on this course, it will make you look stupid. And I thought, what a great line, because one, it makes me look stupid all the time. Like, I don't have to fall asleep on like, it will make me look stupid just me trying to play well. But if you don't pay attention to every single shot, you can be like, how did I just make six on a 297 yard par four? But if you get in the wrong spot, if you think, and I, I, just, I thought Xander had the greatest line. He goes, yeah, you fall asleep out here. It's going to make you look stupid. I'm like, oh, well, that's a good point. So I, I think the course is, it's not long but it is fair and it will bite you if you're not careful and uh so i think the guys like that they respect that and they like it nathan we talk every year about how your job and the planning of this entire tournament it's a year-long process so we normally talk to you prior to the event so at least we can get a little different perspective tonight hmm. uh were you able to take some time off after the tournament what is the planning like say starting next week so uh First of all, yeah, I mean, it, the, the best way I can describe it is that it, it's like the Super Bowl. I mean, it, for us, for Connecticut, I mean, everything culminates in one week, right? And it usually takes probably 15 months 
to plan one event, right? So we, we probably start three months prior to that year's tournament working on the next year's tournament, just because, I mean, you, just, you don't have time to do certain things and you, mm-hmm. you start planning that process and the, the, the sales cycle and the inventory and the pricing and things like that. So it is about a 15 month cycle. Um, to do an annual event. I mean, you take a non-annual event. I mean, you take events that bounce around. I mean, teams will go into markets two, two and a half years in advance before a, um, a PGA championship or something like that. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, there's so many details involved. So, I mean, our team, we have 13 on our team that, that work on the event. And like I said, it's about a 15 month cycle, but they are, I mean, th- those are just the full time employees and that this is our one responsibility we we have to get this right and it has to be perfect for one week a year um but then we have you know seven eight nine interns that start with us from january to june that's another you know group of people then travelers on the title sponsor side i mean they basically have about 20 or so people internally that i mean the tournament isn't their full-time job but they work on some aspect of the tournament um and then you have our volunteers you have thousands of people either taking time off work or carving out this time in their schedule and they're going and they're doing meetings throughout the year and you know we have 30 plus committees that all work together to to make this happen so it is it is a massive amount of people to to put this on but everybody has to be rolling the same direction everybody has to be on the same page because if you're not it shows right i mean your fans show up and they're like wow this doesn't feel right you know, if everybody's not on the same page, the players show up and they're like, oh, gosh, I, this is kind of disconnected. Like, if you don't do it right, everybody is going to notice. But, you know, we've been very fortunate to to have an annual event with a committed title sponsor, really solid group of volunteers. I mean, the the two people on my team that I work the most with, um, Kevin, Kevin Harrington and Tara Gerber, they've been with me 16, 17 years, I mean, since the beginning. So when you have kind of a senior management team that that's been here for so many years to be able to learn from each year and work together and know each other i mean that that's a that's a huge huge benefit so it's uh it's one of those things it's a labor of love but it's really cool because you get to see everything culminate um and then back to the charity point i mean you get to see why that's this is why we do what we do and you actually get to see that every 12 months and that's you know not everybody has that um and so it's uh it's pretty cool and pretty special to be part of the tour and tell me if you could empathize with my next statement, uh, Nathan, about the only drawback of such a special event here in Connecticut once a year is that it does, in fact, come to an end. And, you know, every Sunday <laughs> each year, I start thinking, you know, how fast it went by, um, you know, how I have to get, uh, it, it, how it takes a long time, you know, to basically, uh, you have to wait that another year to be at one of my favorite events, mm. as you know. <laughs> you have to endure another winter that's going through your head. And I know in your position, you know, there is a uh, there's a sense of relief when it's done. But I, I'm sure you can emphasize with my kind of mindset. You think about it in the winter and it, it stays with you. And that, that, that's what makes it so special. Uh, it, you know what? I, I do. I completely feel everything the way you just described. So it, it's kind of a cool cycle, though, because, well, one, it's horribly depressing. Like, you know, Monday morning of after the tournament you're out there and there's nobody you know and it's like wait a minute there was just you know i mean the roars just almost deafened my ear like like i mean and you're you had all this emotional drama and the tv and the energy and the interviews and it's like cricket on monday and you're like what just happened was that a dream was that you know what just happened so there is a you know kind of this depression but then there's like a okay we got to take a deep breath because you just I mean, kudos to, to our team and the, and the volunteers. I mean, they don't get weekends for probably two months. I mean, it's like May and June, you are working seven days a week and it's just a grind. So, I mean, there's a physical aspect of like, okay, we have to take a deep breath and actually, you know, piece everything back together physically because we just gave it literally all we had. Um, but then it's interesting though, because especially in New England, I mean, I don't, you know, I have other counterparts like in Hawaii and that where they, they don't get to, they don't get to feel this, but you go through the winter, Bob, and to your point, like when people see us start coming around, right? The Travelers Championship, when they start to see, oh, hey, you know, there's Nathan, there's Jason, you know, there's the team, they're, they're Rob, they're selling stuff. They're like, oh God, summer's coming. Okay, summer is coming and the Travelers Championship <laughs> does <sign. laughs> represent that this will thaw, you know, and so you, it, it's like you have this 
built-in sense of people are excited to see you because they know what you represent. And so we, we try to definitely lean in on that and be like, yeah, so why don't you get two skyboxes that you can be excited about the summer? So no, I mean, I tease, but it, it is kind of that one of those things where it is hard going in the winter, but we need that time, you know, to plan and to rebuild and to, you know, to rework. And uh, I was actually talking to somebody with uh, the, the yard goats at the um, minor league team that's there in Hartford and they built a beautiful baseball stadium. And I was actually just talking to their, their general manager um, two weeks ago. And I said, you know what? Sometimes I envy you and sometimes I don't. I envy you that you built your stadium and you don't have to build it every year. But, you know, like <laughs> uh, with the yeah. tournament, like we have to. But then I also love the fact that we get to basically design it every year how we want it to be. And if we didn't like an entrance in a certain place, guess what? We're going to move it. If we didn't like concessions in that place, guess what? We're going to move it. If we, if some new technology comes out, we get to incorporate it and build it in. So it's difficult. I mean, the build takes, you know, three months and it's a month to tear down, but. Um, it is very, very cool being able to, you know, kind of keep up with what's happening and what's new and really be able to modify and tweak and change every year. So we, we need the winter to do that. So don't ask us to put one on in June and then August again. We, we definitely need some time. <laughs> For sure. Nathan, we had Sean McKeel on just prior to when you joined us. And Sean uh, made a comment about the impact that, that Live Golf is having on tournaments around the PGA Tour. And you obviously want the best players on tour to be in the field. And now with players being, you know, asked not to come back to the PGA Tour, they're being suspended some you know, permanently, that sort of thing. And even just the splitting of the field, some guys going over to live, others obviously staying on the PGA Tour. Talk about the impact that if you look out next year to, to this tournament or down the road, if Liv becomes successful, what does that mean to you? So I would say this, and again, I can only, obviously there could be a lot of big, you know, picture comments made about this. I, I can only speak to, to us, right? As a, as a PGA Tour event, as a non-major PGA Tour event, um, we are always dealing with something. We're always dealing, I mean, since I've been here in 07, I mean, it's always, okay, for the week after the U.S. Open, who, you know, who's coming, who can't come this year, who's got a conflict. Who is playing in the BMW championship in Europe? Who is playing in X? Like there is for us, and I would say for the majority of tournaments, you're always dealing with some issue with a guy's schedule that, you know, it's like we're never, you, you never get every guy. So somebody asked me that question during our week, they're like, Oh, you're not going to get so and so. I'm like, yeah, that's a normal year. Like I can, I'm always not going to get somebody, you know, like, I mean, I, you know, John Rahm's going to play us two years and then not be there for a year. And Rory will play us three years and not be there. Jordan will play, two, you know, so like it, it's kind of built into the, I would say, the normal course of business for most tour events that you're never going to always get all of the guys. So that was one thing wh that I, it just kind of hit me when somebody said, oh, you're not getting so-and-so. I'm like, yeah, there's every year I don't get somebody. So, I mean, there, there is that element of it where, um, you know, you're always kind of dealing with global competition in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, but then I, I think as, I mean, Sean, I, I love listening to Sean, very thoughtful, thoughtful guy, one of the great guys out there on tour. Um, I, I always love kind of listening to his perspective on things and just love being around him. He's a great guy. Um, and it, it's, it's one of those things like the more, if there is a microscope put on, events, right? Whether it's us, you know, competing golf leagues, upstarts, you know, whatever, team comp, wh whatever it is. Like if you actually put a microscope on it and go, okay, what are these things? And what makes them up? And how are they built? And what's the impact? And why are people doing it? And, and things like that. Like everything that I got excited about over the last half hour, like when I talk about our title sponsor and why they invest in the tournament and what it means to them and the economic impact on the community. And, um, you know, when I talk about camp and, and what they mean and why we're involved with them, and when I talk about our volunteers and, you know, why they volunteer for us and with the Travelers Championship, and I talk about the, the, the crowd, how many people come out and why they come out, I just like, that is something that the PGA Tour has that other places don't have. And I feel like as the magnifying glass gets put on these things and like, oh, what's this? and What's this? And what's this new tour? And what are guys doing? Like, 
I really, really love how we look under that magnifying glass. Like I wouldn't be more proud of all of those things that I talked about. And like, yes, that's, you know, that is who we are. And I love that. And I, somebody uh, asked me the question about, you know, the players, because I think it was um, Brooks, you know, uh, uh, WD our week and Bryson WD and um, uh, the week before. And somebody said something about my sponsors. And I said, I, I literally did this as, as to kind of prove a point. I, I said, I want you to look out at 18 and 17 you know, the, the person was there with me and I said, I have, you know, roughly 300 corporate partners that are out here. You know, I have presenting sponsors. I have title sponsors. I said, there is not one of those companies that asked me who was coming to invest in what this tournament is about. Like there's not, 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 not one contract of my presenting sponsor, of my title sponsor, of you know, all these people that have said, oh, well, you better have this person. No, they know they know what we're about and they have signed on for the long term. And that makes me that makes me feel r- really good about, uh, I would say, where the PGA Tour is and, and, and what we are as a vet. Nathan, one final question. We've talked in the past about your own love for golf and uh, you must feel very fortunate to have access to the TPC, at least at your disposal. Uh, I don't know if we've ever asked you this before, but we just wanted to know your favorite hole as a player and maybe your favorite as a spectator. Oh, man. Uh, favorite hole as a player. You know what? I would say I'm a sucker for 17, and, and here's the problem why. Because mm-hmm. when 17 is downwind, I am dumb enough to try to drive it over the lake and onto the green. And, like, and I just, for whatever reason, <laughs> like when, when I can – when there is a hole that can get me to put aside my like logic and be like, Oh no, you can do this. And you kind of hit, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I love a hole that could actually do that to me. Right. I mean, it's like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it my best and, and stuff like that. So 17 is probably one of my favorites. Um, it's just usually it's beautiful, but I do to watch the tournament. Um, I mean, you have, I would say if you sit on the 15th green, you can see 15, 16, 17 and watch. So, I mean, I don't know that I have one hole that I love to watch, but I definitely have one spot. And we actually built a new venue up on the, up on the left of 17. It's up on the hill. We actually, back to my stadium comment that it's so great that we get to rebuild this thing every year. Mm-hmm. We built a new venue up there and you can literally sit up on this bluff and see everything from the five, five holes. You can see one, you can see two. And then you can see 15, 16, 17, and 18. And I actually don't know of another location on any golf course where you can actually see five holes of golf. Like I actually, I've never, you know, researched this or studied this. When we built the venue up there and I'm standing there looking going, wait a minute, I can see five holes of golf. Like this is, this is unbelievable. So it's just, again, it's how the course is built and designed, but that, that I would say either 15 green or up on the hill on 17 on the bluff where you can see, you can see those five holes is, uh, Pretty special spot. Nathan, before we let you go, remind our listeners how they can stay up to date with all the great things that you guys are doing up there. Follow you online and on social media as well. Well, I would say that's funny. I like Sean's comment. Well, I'm out there. Just Google me. You know, I thought that was so great. <laughs> um, but hopefully we're a little more proactive than that. Hopefully we're a good follow on Twitter and TikTok, and, you know, and all the, all the, all the handles. But at TravelersChampionships.com, everything's there. We have some really good content out there that's people much more savvy than myself um, are putting up and putting out there and from videos to some really good content. So it's all there, travelerschampions.com. And then you can click to Instagram and, uh, and, and TikTok and Twitter and all that fun stuff. So we're out there, but listen, thank you guys for doing what you do, telling the story of these events, bringing to life the players and the stories. It's uh, really, really appreciate uh, what you do for the game. Our pleasure. We appreciate Thank you, Nathan, very much for your time and coming back for a fifth year in a row. It's always a privilege to spend some time with you. Uh, like Bob said, he's he's already looking forward to next year in the tournament, and we're looking forward to catching up with you then, too. Guys, thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Take care, Nathan. Take care, Nathan. Bye-bye. That is the great Nathan Groove, again, tournament director at the Travelers Championship. Bob, it's always a pleasure getting to, to spend some time with Nathan and uh, hearing sort of this year, to your point, Typically, we're talking to him pre-tournament. Now we get a little different perspective to hear, you know, him recount all of the things that happened during tournament week. But uh, a great guy, and I know uh, someone you're very fond of. 
Yeah, we've had him on again, Chris, the years we've had him on before the tournament. And, and what I respect about him so much, he really doesn't uh, sound much different, you know, whether it's before the tournament or after the tournament. And you know what kind of pressure he is under. We've had him uh, the week before the tournament starts. And, man, yeah. I can't imagine a busier job than a, uh, a tournament director right. at that point of a tournament, but uh, he's such an even guy. He is such a, the right man for that job, and that's why he's been around so long now. He's still a young guy, but uh, they like what he does, and nobody does it better. And uh, the proof is in the pudding, as, as you already mentioned. So, uh, yeah, he's he's special, and he's so uh, accommodating about coming on this show and, um, you know, always yep. uh, make sure I'm comfortable. I mean, he does it all, and he does everything right. That's all I can say. Yeah, well, I tell you what, one of the things that I love about Nathan so much, and we talk about this on the football side so often, it's, it's the, it's the positive energy that he brings, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that we always love when we have players on Thursday night tailgate is the, is the energy that they bring to the show, the enthusiasm that, for which they tell the stories and all of that sort of thing. It just, it just sort of brings us all up a notch, if you will, right? And I, and I imagine being around Nathan at the tournament before, during, after, when you're in his presence, uh, the enthusiasm for what he does comes, you know, shining through, and that just makes a positive impact on everybody it touches. And that's you know, a why I love having him on the show. B, it just uh, it's got to be something that you can feel sort of palpable when you're walking around TPC River Highlands. Like I say, whether it's before the tournament, during it, or if you happen to catch him afterwards. Yeah, you can't fake what he does, Chris. And uh, to promise, exactly. uh, you know, what he does, to promise, you know, it's going to be a great tournament, we're going to do this correctly, and, you know, uh, somebody like myself to go there and experience it um, and see that everything works. You know, um, <clears throat> they've treated the media like gold forever. It's been a, pretty tough the last couple years, Chris, because they've had a split the media like into just like the AP and the main people would go into the media center. And a lot of us now are in an auxiliary area, which isn't too bad because you're hanging by an in-ground swimming pool, but <laughs> still, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, he's been under a lot of pressure these last couple of years because of the COVID stuff. I mean, he made it sound like we're totally back to normal, but uh, he'd be the first to say there's a few things that probably he wanted to do that he couldn't. But uh, you wouldn't know from talking to him. He's very, very positive, and uh, you just he'll even bring up the LIV. It doesn't matter with him because uh, he's going to do what he does every year, and people buy into it. And it's uh, it's it's he does it in a way which people totally appreciate too. And uh, again, it's one of the best interviews we do throughout the year of anybody we do. Ah, exactly right. So let me take one of your questions that you asked Nathan and kind of flip it back to you. What's your favorite hole to take? go take a look at as a spectator? Well, you know, Chris, I love, again, I walk the entire course, um, and every year I'm like, yeah, I kind of like this, I like this a little bit, but I just like the stretch between 12 and 14 because it runs parallel with like a, a bunch of railroad tracks, uh, not too far from the uh, general parking area. It's pretty cool. It's just very quiet there. It doesn't seem to get backed up at all. It, it's kind of straight. Uh, that seems to be my kind of my favorite. I, I think 14 is, is really good because it's kind of a downhill. Um, and uh, it seems like every time I go there, especially like on a Thursday or Friday, it's so quiet, nobody's around, and you're basically just walking with the golfers. And uh, So that's what I like. But uh, Nathan's right. When you get to the 15, 16, 17, it's, it's exciting because of the water and the strategy involved. But I just like that stretch um, on the back nine between 12 and 14. Bob, let's do a little bit of uh, a Bob's Take segment on this show like we do over on Thursday Night Tailgate. We've talked an awful lot tonight about live golf. Is it, in your opinion, good for the game, bad for the game, good to have competition out there between the PGA Tour and live golf? What's your thought about what's happening right now in the game? Well, I thought it was, Maybe it was the timing of it all, Chris, because, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm totally sold on the Travelers Championship. And it seemed like a lot of that LIV stuff, the live stuff came up, uh, right when, during the week of this, uh, the Travelers started. A lot of the defecting 
started going on. You know, I mean, Dustin Johnson's been here. Brooks Kepka has been here. Mickelson, you can go right down the line. And I'm sure Nathan's not going to come out and say it. I mean, probably would want those guys playing here. And uh, they have before. And uh, unlike your Tiger Woods or anybody like that. But, uh, you know, those guys, are, they're drawing power no matter what, whether you like them or not. But uh, I just thought the timing of it was bad, Chris. Uh, I mean, competition is competition. But uh, you got to, if you bring the political thing into it, I'm not too keen on what these guys are doing. I know you kind of feel the same way. Um, I I would always, I'll always be a PGA guy. You know, I, I just watch those tournaments. I don't think I'll ever watch a live tournament. I mean, I'll follow it. But there's just, I'm, I'm too invested in the PGA and the travelers and everything to ever put my uh, interest elsewhere. And Bob, we talked about this with Nathan, but, there's been a lot of really low scores out there at TPC River Highlands. He, he talked about Furyk, who shot 58 out there a few years back. A couple of years ago, Dustin Johnson and Brendan Todd shot 61s in the third round. We saw we saw Rory and JT Poston go out and shoot 62 in the first round this year. And there's been a round of 62 or better, 10 of the last 12 tournaments. So of those little rounds, talk about some of the exciting rounds that you've been able to, you know, witness walk the golf course and see. Oh, there's no question, Chris. Uh, I was there when Furyk did it, as he, as he mentioned about five years ago. Um, I had talked to Furyk briefly the day before, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're when you're talking to a guy that's been around as long as Jim had been, you're kind of like, you know, he, he's getting up there in years. You know, is he gonna? I just, I hope he makes the cut. He's a good guy. He, so successful and everything and here he was that next day and and that was the year that i I spent a lot of time in the 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 regular media center and we are following him hole by hole and the scores coming in and you're like can this guy like shoot 60 and then all of a sudden i mean he kept going and going chris the birdies kept coming in and all of a sudden he's going to go under 60 and this is the course to do it but that's the one obviously that stands out but there have been a lot of low ones dustin johnson's gone low here i mean guys if you're a good golfer, Chris, you're probably and have been to Hartford. You're probably going to be under 63 at some point, and that's what's another exciting part of it. I mean, you know, it's not like it's a, it's a par 70 course; they can't go any lower than that as far as par. But these guys, uh, you know, you're always going to see a very, very low score, probably between 60 and 63 in this tournament. That's pretty exciting. And you're just wondering if anybody can ever do it again, break that 60. It's going to happen here. Bob, before I let you go, for our listeners here on the golf side, let them know how they can stay up to date with the great things that you're doing and follow you on social media. Well, Chris, you know, you can go to Twitter. You know, uh, as you know, we post a lot of the interviews that you and I have done, that ones that I've done years ago. Um, That's Bob under slash Lazari. As you know, uh, post post a lot of my archived columns uh, throughout the week, uh, but our YouTube channel, Monday Night Sports 14, all one word. If you go to YouTube and plug that in, you'll see about, uh, there's probably 120 interviews of uh, all kinds of sports legends we've done over the years, so that's probably the best web bet. But uh, Twitter every day, we'll let you know what's going on, for sure. Absolutely. Bob, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to come and be a part of this show. Looking forward to, as we project into the uh, NFL football season, starting our 11th year of doing Thursday Night wow. Tailgate. We'll do that later on this fall. Always a lot of fun to, to share my Thursday nights with you and the, and the great legends of the NFL that join us. So looking forward to that, my friend. In between now and then, stay safe. Yeah, it's coming quickly, Chris, and uh, you stay well and healthy, and uh, we'll talk soon. Take care, Bob. Bye-bye. See you, my friend. That is the great Bob Lazari. Bob underscore Lazari is uh, the follow on Twitter. And again, Monday Night Sports 14 is a, is a TV show he hosted up in uh, in Connecticut for for many years. Uh, uh, a lot of great legends there. But uh, you, you'll you'll hear a lot of it on Thursday Night Tailgate when Bob and I get, get like I said, get ramped up. 11th season coming up soon. So uh, take a look on ThursdayNightTailgate.com to some of our archive episodes as well. Okay, before we close up shop tonight, I want to remind you about a couple of more of our sponsors, starting with our friends over at Two Under. Two Under Men's Performance Briefs have just released their new Spring and Summer 22 collections with fun, new, and exciting prints like the Freedom 2 and 3, Santa Fe, Tigers, 
zebras, and duckies. And their new exclusive Folds of Honor collection, where they donate 20% of all Folds of Honor sales proceeds to that cause. The patented Joey Pouch technology delivers maximum comfort, fit, and performance while preventing any unwanted skin-on-skin contact or chafing. Good for anything from the golf course, to the boardroom, to the bedroom. You can find these two underperformance briefs in over 4,000 golf pro shops nationwide, all Shields sports stores, all PGA Tour superstores, Golf Galaxy, Dillard's, and other fine retailers near you. You can also order them online at 2under.com. That's the number 2, U-N-D-R.com. 2under, performance in your pants. Use code NEXT20, that's N-X-T-T-E-E-20, for a 20% discount on the 2under website. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Golf Ride. We deal with a lot on the golf course, whether you're teeing off in front of a crowd, hitting a four iron after a rain delay, trying to figure out wind direction, or second guessing club selection. It's easy for your mind to race. That's exactly what drove Golf Pride to create the all new CPX. It's made with a unique EXO diamond quilted pattern, reducing vibration in your hands on every shot. The EX Diamond Quilted Pattern really helps your hands sink into the club on every shot, giving you maximum comfort because when your hands are comfortable, you're comfortable. CPX is available now on GolfPride.com or at your local retailer. All right, my friends, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the Team. My sincere thanks go out again to John Mahaffey, Sean McKeel, Bob Lazari, and Nathan Groove for joining me tonight. Next week, I'm going to be taking some more time off with my wife and kids. We're going to the beach. When I return, though, on Tuesday, August the 9th, my guests are going to be a guy who's been joining me going all the way back to episode number three of this show. That is former PGA Tour Pro Bob Friend Jr. Another great friend in PGA Tour Pro, Donnie Hammond, will also be back with me that night. And then we're going to round out the show with one of the top 100 instructors in the game, Tim Cusick. So, folks, it's going to be a great show. I hope you'll come back and be a part of it with me. You can listen to this show as a podcast on just about every major podcasting app out there. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Audioboom, Player.fm, Podcast.co, Podbean. Folks, if you've got a favorite podcast site or app, just type in Next on the T in the search bar. You'll probably find us on there as well. Folks, please check out our website nextonthetea.net to see what our upcoming guest schedule looks like. Plus, we give you links back to recent episodes and individual guest segments. So whether you've got 20 minutes or two hours, we've got great content on there for you as well. My friends, thank you so much again for choosing to listen to this show tonight. I know you've got a lot of great golf podcasts out there to choose from. I am very thankful that you continue to make Next on the Tea one of them. Until two weeks from tonight, hit them straight, my friends.